Jones. Welcome to Interchange. We have really interesting things to talk about today. So the ownership of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel is changing again. We lose a corporate headquarters, but will the newspaper even survive? We'll talk about Governor Walker appointing Rebecca Bradley to the state Supreme Court. Does this mean she could be a reliable conservative on the court for decades to come? And we'll talk about Northwestern Mutual building another huge building in downtown Milwaukee. But before we get going, I will introduce everyone once again. You know, longtime newspaper columnist Joel McNally, Gerard Randall, education and job creation consultant, and Denise Calloway, former TV news reporter, now a communications and public relations professional. All right, let's talk first about the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. It was a major change in the media landscape just a few months ago when ownership and management of the newspaper changed. Now it's going to change again. The huge Gannett Company, which publishes USA Today and lo local newspapers around the country and all around the state of Wisconsin, they're going to buy the Journal Sentinel. If you're a reader of the Journal Sentinel, should you be happy or worried? If you're an employee, should you be happy or worried? You were a longtime employee. <laughs> How would you like to be in that newsroom now? Uh, I'd be horrified. Uh, truthfully, and in fact, a number of people in that newsroom are. I've, I talked to a few people today, and, and uh, you know, they were told when the Scripps Howard deal went through um, that mainly because of, of some tax uh, considerations, they wouldn't have to worry about another major change for a couple years. Um, and, uh, and this really hit people out of nowhere. And uh, not only did it hit people out of nowhere, but there are a number of people in that newsroom who have been part of Gannett takeovers elsewhere, and, and it is famously horrid. Uh, there's a, there was actually a, a book written about the, the takeover in Green Bay called The Chain Gang, and it's pretty much raping local newspapers uh, and, and replacing a lot of the content with the uh, USA Today content and, and nation, their national coverage. So if I were in the Washington Bureau right now, I'd be very concerned. And there's some excellent reporters in the Washington Bureau. Uh, the, the State Bureau out of Madison, you know, is probably the strongest, mm -hmm. some of the strongest state coverage in this state, but they don't know if they're going to be really doing Madison reporting or if they're going to be reporting on Madison for all the smaller papers around the state, uh, they have no idea. And, but they do know that, that famously, uh, in the Gannett organization, USA Today has resources to do whatever it wants. The Arizona Republic might have that as an individual newspaper, but most of the other individual newspapers have very little power, very little control, and very few resources. It's hard to believe that uh, the Journal Sentinel could deteriorate any more than it mm -hmm. has before our eyes mm -hmm. already, but uh, I fear that you know it's it's headed for even even worse times. You know, we have talked so many times about oh, the newspaper business is dying, the newspaper business is dying. Well, if it's dying, why would Gannett be paying such a big chunk of money, like almost fifty percent more than the stock is worth, for this newspaper company? Well, there's economies of scale that they're hoping to achieve in, in, in the whole deal. Um, which means cutting staff. Which cut, <laughs> you cut staff and you cut print cost uh, overall by having uh, more centralized printing operations. And, uh, and frankly, um, I've not been impressed in the last few years when the journal has cut staff to position itself to be purchased by, uh, by scripts. So it's, um, it's tragic in a lot of ways, too. I think the one element that, that I'll kind of uh, reflect on that, that, that Joel uh, alluded to, the, the local control. And it's not just local editorial control. It's now we're going to miss um, what newspapers historically have meant to communities in terms of being able to push issues in a community, drive issues in a community, and also to encourage the corporate leadership in a community to move in a certain direction, um, it, I just don't see, or the political community in a, uh, to move in a certain direction. I don't see a national operation having that same level of concern for Milwaukee, no matter what the issues are. I think this is a buy and burn kind of operation, and it won't be too long before we see the results of that. You know, Denise, I remember when Gannett started USA Today, everybody panned and said it was horrible, it was never right. going to survive. It did survive, and it influenced almost every single newspaper in the country. Mm -hmm. So this company does know what they're doing, though. 
I mean, Gannett does know what it's doing. I mean, it's it's built a situation for itself where it's over, over um, 110 communities around the country. It is a, whether or not we may like what it does to companies and communities, it is a media force to be reckoned with. Um, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but somebody on this panel, two years ago, <laughs> we were having another discussion about what's happening to the journal, really thought that it was being primed for um, sale and that Gannett was a likely buyer. And in many ways— Who said that, Kevin? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm joking. Come on, Dan. <laughs> oh, I'll give it to Kevin. He's not here. Sure. Um, but one of the things that, that happens is Gannett is really well-positioned from its point of view, to create a series, to kind of create a super newspaper in Wisconsin. They'll be able to cover from the northwest part of the state all the way down to Milwaukee um, by really, I think, diminishing the workforce that they have. Um, people certainly saw it uh, at the Apple Post Crescent and at the Green Bay Gazette when you have those two newspapers so close together and how they ended up writing for each other all the time. Um, Gannett will be able, on a shoestring, with fewer people than it has even now, to be able to cover the entire state of Wisconsin. And if you put that local news on the front page and you sandwich a version of USA Today inside the middle, you know, you really diminish the number of reporters that you actually need. And I think this is a city where, um, gosh, I don't want to sound like I'm super old, but the merger of the Journal Sentinel from two papers already deeply, I believe, diminished the quality of reporting that we have. That's not a slight on anybody who's there. Everybody's better when you have competition. And when the two papers merged, there was no competition. Will, will Milwaukee miss the corporate headquarters? Did the, did the corporate headquarters of the Journal Sentinel or the Journal Media Company offer that much to Milwaukee? Well, I think he gave more independent control mm -hmm. uh, to the local newspaper. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 I've warned people for years that when, uh, you know, it really is outside control, um, you really have very little power in the community and, and, uh, and power over your own bottom line, really. I mean, uh, they, they use all these words. Every time there's a takeover, they always talk about, you know, the local commitment and, and, right. and the local ideas. And, and, uh, but if you don't have any money to hire anyone or pay anyone to, to cover you we we're already seeing much less covered in the newspaper right. there's much less for us to talk to talk about on this show as a result of, of the de the deterioration of, of of what had been the best and largest newspaper in the state and um, uh, yeah there are still good people doing good work uh, but at, at least the one of the missions of, of the paper up to now has been to do a lot of that national and even regional investigative right. stuff to win a awards and, and with long features and the, the mm -hmm. people don't bother to read but they but they win awards and 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 that's the purpose Dave Barry uh, the humor columnist used to say the, those kinds of stories should have labels you know you don't have to read this this is for awards and and <laughs> um, but boy it's sad I mean it really is because this the journal and Sentinel came along later, and it was a bad newspaper for a while under Hearst, uh, and it became a much better newspaper under journal ownership. Uh, but the journal created this community in a lot of ways, and and um, and it's 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 happening everywhere. Yes, but but um, but that's just sad. I mean, it, it really it is, is sad. And one of the things that you alluded to is that, in some ways. Over the past two years, um, even facing the economic pressures that it's faced, some of the best work that the Journal Sentinel has done in terms of investigative journalism, we've seen over the past two, three, four years when they have been in a financial vice. Um, and we've got people who have dedicated their lives, not just to the newspaper, but to making this community a better place. Right. And I'm really concerned that some of those people will say, you know, this is it. And then who replaces them to really be that voice uh, sometimes of, 
um, reason and contention <laughs> and, and to really promote dialogue and yeah. discussion in this community. They discourage I, dialogue now, really. Well, uh, they, they don't want to get do. in the controversial they but, subject. They don't, but they, they feel that their mission on the editorial side is to raise issues so people can talk among themselves, like we do. It'll um, need me to read a, a half dozen online blogs to get I some of the know. same investigative information that the journal used to provide. Exactly. It's, 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 it's a potentially a very sad day for our community. All right, next topic. You know, it was just a few years ago when Governor Scott Walker appointed Rebecca Bradley to a position as a Milwaukee County Circuit Court judge, and just a few months ago when he selected her for a position as a Court of Appeals judge. Now he's named her to fill a position on the Wisconsin Supreme Court, open because of the recent death of Justice Patrick Crooks. If Bradley is then elected to the position next year, and this certainly makes her a frontrunner, she could be a voice on that court for decades to come. Conservatives are pleased, liberals are not. Good choice? Uh, several concerns. One, I, this will be a test of whether the governor has uh, coattails that she can ride on in order to get there. Certainly, the, the, the party infrastructure will be behind her. Uh, conservative uh, advocate money will be behind her. She has two candidates that uh, will be running against her that will also be well-financed, though. <clears throat> Uh, Kloppenberg, to the left, will be adequately financed, and she'll be able to get her message out. And then in the middle, the, the, the ground that Joe Donnell has, has staked out, I think his voice will be loudly heard, too. So the primary is not going to be a cakewalk for her. And it's very likely that that primary uh, will end up being a, uh, a test of whether uh, she can stand up to the criticism that she's the governor's candidate at a time when the governor's popularity is not as high as it would need to be in order to, you know, adequately carry her in as, as, uh, as an incumbent. Time frame for being an incumbent is very short. And so the question then becomes, what kind of judicial record will she have as an incumbent Supreme Court justice to carry into the election. And, you know, I'm not saying that uh, that's going to be substantial enough, uh, one, to keep criticism away from her, and two, to get people to rally behind her. So those are the issues that I see she's going to have to grapple with in this election. Now, you can't really bash Walker, can you? Because other, other governors have done this in the past from both parties. <laughs> and it's, it, it is politics that if you have the ability to do it, why wouldn't you do it? Uh, yeah, and we know that, that he, you know, will use any political power he can to push his agenda. Uh, but I, but I, I agree a little bit with with Gerard that being the governor's flunky, you know, is not necessarily well, a, strong, a strong <laughs> position to run from, especially a time when Skywalker's popularity is at the, the historic lows. Uh, so I don't know if that even gives her an advantage. It gives her a little advantage, and there are several things about judi these judicial races which we need to fix somehow. One is that practically no one votes in the in the in the elections. Uh, and those that do sometimes don't even know anything except the name of the candidates because the local press doesn't really cover uh, judicial elections very well. Um, I, I, you know, so she'll have the advantage of, of seeming to be the incumbent, even though she, she was just made the incumbent uh, appeals court judge and she didn't even get the seat warm. I, I don't think she'll have any record on the Supreme Court going into the election. And she's had no record on, on the appeals court uh, to get this appointment. You know, I remember when an appointment to the high court was someone who had a long judicial history and, and uh, experience. Uh, experience and expertise. This is, this is a child, basically, who, is, who has moved so rapidly by appointment by this particular governor uh, you know, to the highest court in the state. Uh, without it, you know, she did win a local election after being appointed to the county uh, seat, mm -hmm. uh, but she hasn't won an election to the appeals court. Now she will be a Supreme Court judge without getting, winning an election there. Uh, I, I agree. Joe Donald is a good, strong Milwaukee candidate. Joanne Kloppenberg probably has most of her support out of Madison because she ran against David Prosser, and, and that name is well known. Uh, I'm hoping in these off-year judicial elections 
the, the turnout is growing all the time. It used to be that only Republicans turned out for those elections, and so that gave them a real advantage. Uh, now Democrats have started to turn out, which is why Republicans are trying to keep Democrats from voting. But <laughs> that's a whole different issue. If, if, if I'm not mistaken, there are, there are people who have gone to that job without any judicial experience. I think from the state legislature, they've run and, and, and become a Supreme Court justice. So is that really a reason for concern? Well, they have run. I mean, I think that's the difference, where people have been able to see what their opinions are, um, kind of look at their records, and then make a decision about whether or not you were a, a municipal court or a judge or if you were in the Court of Appeals, and that is a vital bit of your experience that's important to being a Supreme Court justice. I, I think the problem with... Um, Justice Bradley, I don't know how they're going to decide which is Justice Bradley one and which is Justice Bradley yeah. two. And that um, might help her or hurt her, depending on right. what people think of the other I, Justice right. Bradley. I, I just, I, I think she is at a true disadvantage. The governor's ratings in this state have never been as low as they are now. Um, you know, he's at 37 percent. I don't think that gives her much of a boost. Um, it'll, we'll have to see what happens over the next six months with the governor, but um, I don't know that he can repair the damage that he did to his own reputation here that quickly. Um, she will be seen in many circles as the governor's candidate. That is not something that will certainly help her. Um, but I, I think the main thing about it is you, we don't know anything about her. It's not just that she doesn't have a judicial record. We don't know how she stands on certain issues. She has not been um, on the appeals court long enough for us to make any assumptions. And she hasn't really talked about it um, herself. So I think this is purely a political appointment and probably one of the most extreme examples that we've seen in Wisconsin in a long time. Our Supreme Court certainly has its difficulties in its head, its, its troubles. But it's been... This an, one doesn't necessarily it, help. It, it, it's been an august, robust, respected body throughout not just Wisconsin, but throughout the United States. And this, to me, I, I have to look at people who have been long-term justices on that court, who came in with tons of experience. And to have someone who's purely such a political appointment is a little bit of a slap in the face. And I, I worry about what that means in terms of some of their decisions. Is this someone who even has the knowledge, capability, and the experience to really make good decisions on that court? Here's my prediction. It will come down in the February primary to Judge Donald and Judge Bradley. In April, when the election is held, <clears throat> you will have both the Republican primary and the Dem primary, and turnout will be large because both of those presidential primaries will be contested. And that will drive turnout, and this race will drive statewide interest as well. And that will then come down to which state or which party has mm -hmm. the best machinery for turnout for their candidate. And I would argue that in a presidential election year, Joe Donald might look pretty good in that heads-up matchup. All right, next topic. Milwaukee's Northwestern Mutual, which is building a huge 32-story, $450 million new headquarters building downtown right now, just announced that they are also going to build a huge 33-story, $100 million high-end apartment complex and parking structure right in the same neighborhood. With all this development going on downtown, the new basketball arena, the new apartment complex, it has to make you think if downtown Milwaukee has a really bright future. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm kind of impressed to tell you the truth. Uh, you know I, you know I know there there are a number of people concerned about a lot of this development is taking place right on the lakefront mm -hmm. and and is our lakefront getting taken over by private interest instead of public interest? Uh, but in fact there there are major downtown buildings and a number of them. There's there's one I haven't even figured out what it is yet that that is going up before our eyes. <laughs> before that uh, you know the one that's going to be the center of all the mm -hmm. rapid transit and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, it, it's interesting to me that it seems that one of the in 
the impetus for this building was not selling the parking structure to Northwestern Mutual, uh, which was a public parking structure and, and part of a public park. And there were plenty of reasons to keep that a public space rather than selling it to a private company where you were afraid you're going to lose park space. It had never been done before. Uh, and, and so, OK, well, we'll let you, you'll build a, a private building then that, that is another, you know, pretty impressive building uh, downtown, uh, you know, because you didn't get to steal our parking structure. <laughs> so I, I think that worked out pretty well. You know, so often, Denise, we, we talk in this program about, wow, is Milwaukee becoming the next Detroit? Our crime numbers are horrible. This is horrible. That's that's horrible. Uh, uh, now, you look at the pictures of what the, what the downtown skyline, at least, is going yeah. to look like in the years ahead, and you're thinking, uh, I don't know, maybe the future is brighter than we think. Well, I, I think that, and the mayor's alluded to this, there's a lot going on downtown. And there certainly is, and what Northwestern Mutual is doing, I think, really is a sign of the fact that it's not only a good corporate citizen, it's a committed corporate citizen in terms of working to help improve um, lives of people in this community and to present opportunities. My gosh, the, the hundreds and hundreds of jobs that are going to be created just by the construction of these two massive buildings. Um, and they will be, they're going to look pretty and they're going to look nice on our skyline. And maybe um, if you're sitting at just the right part of River West, you'll be able to see those and you'll ask yourself, why don't I see any development like that in my community? So I think as great as things are in downtown, to me it also shows that very great contrast in terms of what isn't happening in our neighborhoods where we have increasing crime. You know, where we have these issues of foreclosures that are really plaguing some of our neighborhoods. You know, it's, it's great what's going on downtown. I love going downtown. I love looking at the growth that's happening there. And it does make me feel good when I come over the bridge and I see that great skyline. <laughs> and we know that there are good things happening for a lot of people in our town. But there also are things that need to happen in our neighborhoods that have it. I'm sure the mayor and his folks would point to the big announcement of $30 million that's coming in for West Lawn, but that's federal money that's being invested. Where is the effort to court some of those same folks who are building in downtown to build and invest in some of our communities? Some people like the Bucks have already started to have discussions like that, but I do believe those discussions are few and far between. And if we're going to build a robust downtown, that's awesome. But if we don't build up our neighborhoods, ain't nobody going to be there to come downtown to see what's going on. For years, we've laughed about how Wisconsin Avenue is kind of like a ghost town after uh, 7 o'clock at night. That might be changing, too, in the next few years. Well, let's talk about Northwestern Mutual in particular. Remember, they were the primary investors in Grand Avenue. Uh, back when Grand Avenue still had uh, Marshall Field or Gimbel's just before, and they hung in there long after it was no longer profitable for them to do so. They got out, perhaps, at just the right time before it really became a fire sale kind of thing. So their commitment has been long in trying to, one, stabilize the downtown, but now to robustly grow a downtown community. They had a plan B when plan A the purchase of the, the, the county-owned parkland uh, had fallen through, and they stuck to that plan. I mean, keep in mind, there were people, even I thought, that they were going to come back and, and, and unload um, the, uh, the space that they had committed themselves to for parking and then try to repurchase that, uh, that county land. And then lastly, you look at the new leadership at Northwestern Mutual, John Schlifsky has put in place what I think is a unique answer to not just building downtown, but putting money into neighborhoods through investing in schools public schools in particular, like Carver School, the half million that was put in there. And I think you'll see more investment in improving neighborhood schools through Northwestern overall. And, and that's right. great, but it's not enough. It, I we, didn't say we've got to take care of neighborhoods. Neighborhoods in Milwaukee are deteriorating. And if we don't have that same emphasis and effort in neighborhoods that we have in downtown, 
not going to make a difference except we'll all have a great trolley route. Let's hear what right. these political leaders say. Well, major turmoil in Washington this week, and one part of that was a sudden mix of congressional conflict, presidential politics, and diplomatic tragedy. One of the leading players in this drama was maybe the most famous politician in the world. And the other one? Somebody most people had probably never even heard of. Here's Rick Horowitz to try to sort it all out. Rick. Far be it from me to offer advice to her, but this time I'll make an exception. And it all has to do with this guy. This is Kevin McCarthy. He's the majority leader of the House of Representatives. And until just days ago, the favorite to be the next Speaker of the House. But then the future Speaker spoke about Hillary Clinton and the Benghazi hearings. The latest Benghazi hearings, that is. There have been so many. McCarthy spoke and he gave the game away. The GOP's tantrum caucus was not pleased. Seems McCarthy was bragging to Sean Hannity about what fighters House Republicans are. And his prime example, trying to take down the Democrats' 2016 frontrunner. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right, said McCarthy. But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. Oops. See, everyone kind of knew that that was the Republican agenda on Benghazi, but no one had been foolish enough, crass enough, to actually say it out loud, to admit that all their supposed concern about four good Americans in a faraway land was simply cover for inflicting political damage. Now, as uh, Dan has had numerous occasions to point out over the years, I've never been a Hillary Clinton fan. But even I have to cringe at this one. Exploiting the deaths of dedicated public servants to score campaign points? It's unseemly. That's a polite word for disgusting. And there's more to come. Clinton testifies before this Benghazi committee on October 22nd, so expect more crocodile tears from certain members. Meanwhile, they'll try to pretend that McCarthy hasn't just pulled back the curtain on the whole sleazy effort. So anyway, here's my advice for Hillary Clinton. Every time a committee Republican asks a question, she should answer by reading McCarthy's words. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. Now, what was your question again, Congressman? Every time, to every question. Read their words back at them so often that folks watching on TV have them memorized by lunchtime. By mid-afternoon, they're trending on Twitter. By nightfall, little girls are using them to jump double dutch. Then maybe, maybe, Hillary Clinton's congressional stalkers will realize they've ridden their fake outrage as far as it can go. Hey, I can dream, can't I? Thanks, Rick, and thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. What everyone